Good morning, everyone. It's glad, it's glad to see, happy to see you today. Um, we do have some announcements. There is a congregational meeting after church today, and the purpose of the meeting is to go over the annual committee reports. So please plan to stay for that. The deacons meeting that is tomorrow night, the time has been changed to five o'clock. So it's five o'clock and then there's a Bible study starting at six, which will have um, a dinner and then the study. The menu for the dinner will be ham barbecues, cream of broccoli soup and a dessert. So plan to come for six o'clock for the Bible study. Also, uh, there's church cleanup day on May 13th, so please mark your calendars and come to help uh, beautify the church outside. Uh, there is a high tea, and that is on May 20th, so please make your reservations to come for the high tea. Am I missing any of the announcements? Oh, the, um, there is a funeral tomorrow at noon here for... Doris Klein. Mm -hmm. So vis visitation for her is from 915 to 1015 at the Kern Schaefer Funeral Home in Apollo. Mm -hmm. So um, please plan on coming to say our goodbyes to our beloved member of the church. Also to one other announcement, if you are watching online, um, the video feed, the live feed, will be cut off at the congregate when the congregational meeting starts, so you will not be able to um, view the congregational meeting. Are there any other announcements? Uh, there's choir on Wednesday, so if you want to come and sing a joyful noise unto the Lord with the choir, come do that. Any other announcements? Okay, Katie believes it's Deacon Sunday. Um, is that the fifth? Yes. Okay, so the money is going to. Yeah. Where's it going to? Uh, this Sunday will go to Apollo. The last one is this. Okay, so Apollo, it'll go to Apollo Ridge School District? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the loose offering. Um, also, more news on the car crews. There's flyers in the back for everyone. Um, we decided on Saturday, June 10th from 2 to 6 p.m. Um, it'll be cash only. We're going to have food, music, raffle baskets, and lots of fun. Um, the mission will start at 1.30. It's free to register your cars. Um, you're going to register by July 1st to me and the, all the information's on this flyer. Um, next week I'm going to have people sign up. There'll be a sign-up sheet in the back if you'd like to donate. Um, anything for raffle baskets or baked goods and it's gonna be fun so I hope everybody can come mm -hmm. are there any other announcements we do have some birthdays this week we have Tanner Harris Victoria Stefanci Kathy Flick Thomas Kissel Bill King Nancy Bowerly <laughs> Michaela Stefanci and Cindy Jones so can we sing some happy birthdays to these people? Thank you very much, and I hope everybody has a very happy birthday. Okay. Um, Let us open our hearts to worship God.
Let us pray. Lord, as we gather here today to worship you, please open our hearts that we may accept you and open our ears that we can hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I will worship you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you restored me to the hell. You brought me up, O Lord. You restored my life as I was going down the grave. Sing to the Lord, you faithful servants. Weeping may spend the night, but joy comes in the morning. Loving God, glorious in giving and restoring life, do not hide your face from your people, overcome with loneliness and fear. Turn our weeping into dancing, our despair into joy, and raise us up with Christ, that we may rejoice in your presence forever. Amen. Please stand and sing hymn number 295, Blessed Assurance. Though we all sin, let us come to the Lord and confess our sins. Almighty God, you raised Jesus from death to life and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have gone along with the ways of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from sin that we may be your faithful people obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the world and is head of the church, his body. Amen. As it says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. May God, may our God, who is the resurrection, peace and joy be with us all. We embrace our God of the resurrection, peace, and joy.
please be seated and will the children come forward.
Please pray with me. Lord, open up our hearts and minds by the invisible power of the Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with faith, love, and joy what it is you have to say to us today. Transform our human words into your divine word, O God. Amen. The Old Testament reading today is Psalm 23, found on page 862 of your pew Bibles. <clears throat> A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our gospel reading is from John, chapter 21. After Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, it happened this way. Simon Peter Thomas, called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. For they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you tr truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. 
Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. How does a church revive and or grow? How does a church revive and or grow? That's one of the number one questions that many Christians have been asking over the last decade or so. And we need to understand that church grows and that there are various approaches from the scriptures that lead us to understand how this happens. Today we will consider the ways in which God opens up people to become new members of the body of Christ. And I start with my own journey and story, and it's how I became a faithful member, or I'd like to believe a faithful member, of the PCUSA. It was about 19 years ago, which even thinking about that is uh, something to consider, when God was working on me to grow as a believer in Jesus Christ. I was working with a spiritual director. I was reading the Bible every day. I was doing a lot of repentance, seeking, working on reconciliation, all the various things that God encourages us to do to grow in our relationship with God, to be in right connections with other people. And this is a part of the process that we should go through throughout our lives, not just at one major turning point. And I was reading many spiritual books, and there was one book that I was reading that some of you may have read and had a major impact on the church about 20 years ago, The Purposeful Driven Life. Now, the biggest thing that inspired me from this book was that the writer encouraged people to make sure that they pick a church, pick one that's close to them, just like they encourage people that if you want to work out, you pick a gym that's close to you so that you can go there often, as opposed to one that's far away where you might have the excuse of going, oh, it's too far, I can't go today. So I was inspired by this, that really God tugged on my heart that I needed to join a church. I mean, I'd gone to church off and on all my life, but I hadn't committed. Actually, I didn't even know that you joined a church until about 20 years ago. So I went to a Presbyterian church and they said, you should join. And I was like, what's that all about? I never heard about that. So it's amazing. Many people just assume that people know that they should join or how they will be impacted if they join a church. And so I started praying throughout the neighborhood where I lived at the time, which was Monroeville. And I kept praying and driving around and was like, kept asking God, where do you want me to go? And then I started to feel this spiritual nudge. It was almost like this sense of every time I passed this one church, which was Hillcrest Presbyterian Church in Monroeville, I felt like God was drawing me there. And so I did. I started to go. And then I started to notice that I started to grow in my relationship with God. And I had no idea that I was called to that church and that that would begin the process for me to be called to seminary school, and then to ministry. Because a year after going, I was in seminary school. That was not my plan, but that was obviously God's plan. And so when I think about that, it helps me to realize 
that not everybody knows what it means to experience a call of God. That they don't understand what it means to be called to a specific church. Many people, many of you, probably have come here because your family brought you here. And you have that connection. But then for those of us who don't have a connection with a church, we are sometimes called there. And that that's one of the things we're encouraged to do, is to pray for people in the community, to pray that God would open up the hearts and minds of people, that they would be called here. And that this is a process that the scriptures point us to understand how God, number one, opens up people's hearts and minds to be called. That we are to seek other people who are called to be Christians. And that we are to, number two, gather them into the boat of the church so that, number three, we can feed them, love them, and take care of them. So number one, we are called to seek other Christians. Now Jesus had called his first disciples, James, John, Peter, and Andrew, to leave behind their family profession in order to become spiritual fishers of men and women because they were fishermen. That's what they did for a living. And God was transforming them from being disciples into becoming evangelists and missionaries for God. And the call to be an evangelist and missionary was similar to their previous occupation of being fishermen. They had to go out every day, get into their boats, and look for fish. They had to work at learning how to cast their nets in order to catch fish. Do I have any fishermen or women out there? You're a fisherman, fisher boy, fisher girl? Oh, nice. Well, one of the amazing things about my journey to Galilee, to Jerusalem, is that we had the chance to get in a boat and go on a boat ride across the sea where Jesus went and the disciples went and to learn about what they did to catch fish. And for them, they used three different fishing nets. Now, number one, one net was cast out by hand and used for skimming along the shallow waters looking for fish. That was one. The second way was that the net was spread out and trawled out along the waters with poles. And then the third net was cast out into deep waters. These are the three different approaches that they used to try and catch fish. Now, in the same way, the disciples had to learn and work To catch fish, they had to go out and seek people for Christ. Because they weren't coming to them, right? The fish don't just jump up and say, hey, take me. They had to go do something. First, they had to learn to discern where to go, where the fish and people were gathering in order to catch them. Second, they had to learn how to catch them and reel them in. And Jesus Christ gradually taught them how to become spiritual fishers of men and women. Now, Peter and the other disciples went fishing, but they were fishing in the wrong spot of the waters. They didn't catch any fish, and then the risen Lord appeared and told them where to fish. Jesus said, cast your nets on the right side of the boat. And they had to listen to him, hear him, and obey him. Because that's what we know about the Hebrew word for hearing. It's like you were told when you were young, at least I heard this all the time, if you listened to what I said, you would have heard what I said, and then you would have done what I asked you to do. Anybody remember that? Because sometimes we're not listening, or we're acting like we're listening, but we don't hear, and then we don't do it. And it's amazing that that's straight out of the Bible. That's what God is talking about. God speaks. Who's listening? Who heard the Lord right? And did they do what they were supposed to do? And yes, this is a process of discernment that we're always learning. Just like throughout our lives, if we're continually learning, we're trying to listen, hear, and obey. And the same is true about discerning where God is leading people to reach out, to help people, 
to love them, to help them to know the Lord. And so it is the same for a church to be revived and to grow. We need to be willing to cast out our nets where we can catch new people or we can reach new people. We can stretch this metaphor as far as we can, but there is that connection that he was trying to teach them and why he called them. So what does it mean for us to reach out in the new way of where God wants us to reach out to? What does that look like? These are some of the questions we need to ask God in prayer. This is a part of revival, that we have to be intentional about our prayers. And at times, I've encouraged and done this myself many times, is pray through communities. Pray through your neighborhoods. Either you go for walks, any walkers out there, you can be praying as you walk through the neighborhood. Maybe not standing in front of people's houses like, oh, Lord. They might call the cops on you. But you can drive by or walk by and go, Lord, bless that house silently. Or even, you know, to yourself. Or you can do what we call like prayer drive-by. You can drive in your car. Now, don't close your eyes. But you can drive by and go, Lord, bless them. God, love them. And I've been amazed in the past 19, 18 years that by doing prayer walks, where you have entire communities of people or groups of prayer teams going out into communities and praying through them, how revival has happened, that places that were run down, things have been torn down and built up. That happened when I was in Cheswick. God kept saying, go through that old shopping center and keep praying for revival. And then they tore down that old Cesarina. Remember that? I went roller skating there all the time. But, but they needed to tear some of that down in order to rebuild it. And that there's still being renovations going on in that area. Or when I was in seminary school, we went out as groups and prayed throughout Garfield, East Liberty. And this is before they rebuilt it all up. And Garfield is where my family's from, my, my grandparents. And that I watched it be the type of place when I drove through there in the 90s, I get pulled over. What are you doing here? I was, they were like, normally people like you don't come here unless they want something bad. I was like, well, my family's from here, and they didn't care. And it's amazing, after a period of time praying through that area, what God has done to revive that area. It's amazing. I even was praying one time, walking down this one street called Hillcrest, which ended up being the church I was called to, and I'm praying, and then all of a sudden I get a call from my grandmother, and I said, Grandma, I'm praying in your old neighborhood. I said, which street did you live on? She's like, Hillcrest. I was like, what number? And she said the number, and I was standing right in front of it. That's the power of prayer. That's the power of God saying, Just like we see with the the prophets talking about the Lord will tear it all down that's old and run down, uproot all the weeds, and replant and regrow. No? No? Yes, it can happen. Trust me. (laughs) So that's part of what we do is we're asking God to guide us to pray through our neighborhoods, to pray through our community, throughout our city, for God to revive and grow. And this is a part of the process. And we all have different talents and abilities. Some people are homemakers. Some are chefs. Some are good at hospitality. Some are evangelists and they don't even necessarily know it. Some are missionaries. Some are preachers. And that God calls us all to understand our call even at different stages of our life. No matter how old or young you are, God can use you and call you in different ways. And so that's what we're asking God to help us to understand. What do we need to do to be faithful to God's new call to reach new people, or at least to bless them? This is a part of the process of revival. And that when the disciples did what Jesus said, there was abundance. There was plenty of people 
There was plenty of fish. There was enough resources to go around, and they shared them, and they grew. And so we are called to seek other Christians and to gather them into the boat of the church. Now, in the early Christian church, the boat was a symbol and metaphor for the church. Think about it. The boat was a movable form of transportation and a means of making a living. And the early church had to be flexible in how they moved around and how they might transport people from one place in their lives to another in Christ. They also had to provide them with ways to sustain their new lives in Christ. And that's what we see happening more and more with the church is many churches are figuring out other ways to gather revenue. Some are starting restaurants. That's become a popular thing in the last, I don't know, decade or so. That people are figuring out by God's inspiration what way to bring in more money and to reach people in a different way. And that's being creative. And God has blessed some of those in amazing ways. And so I have watched many different churches who realize that they're a missional boat. That they go out, they pray, they seek what God wants them to do, and then they're faithful. And in sometimes we see revival. Sometimes we see growth. And that has been on my heart and mind this year since I started here is to encourage everyone to pray for revival. We have to be intentional about this. We have to get groups of people who are really passionate about this, who are praying for this and working at it, in order that more and more people get to know Christ. Because we believe that when you know Christ, you know peace, you know God's love, that you have hope for the future that you get to understand God's plan for your life and that you have the gift of eternal life as well. We believe this is extremely important. It has transformed our lives. I know it has transformed mine. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here today. So that's a part of the process. And so we are called to seek other Christians, to gather them into the boat of the church, And to love them, feed them, and care for them. So we have in this story that after they shared a communal meal, Jesus turned around and asked three questions of Peter. Now why did Jesus do this? First of all, it seems like a reversal of what Peter did to Jesus. He publicly denied Christ three times. Now Peter had to be forgiven and recommissioned by Christ, so Jesus had him publicly promise in front of the others to dedicate himself to learning the three new ways of loving God through loving people. Once God has sent us as new people, we have to go out and gather new people. And how do we love them? This is the ongoing process of life, the spiritual life, learning how to love, learning how to serve in the way God wants us to serve. So Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then he says, feed my lambs. And the lambs are who? The children. The lambs are the children. We're called to bless and teach the children. To help them have some fun in church. That's why VBS is a wonderful thing that we continue to do, right? No matter what, we don't want to give up on the call to reach out to children. To young adults and help them to understand and know Jesus. And so then he asks him again. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Then Jesus said, shepherd my sheep, which is all of the people of God. For them to be guided, Peter was called to be a leader of the church, to shepherd the people, to help them to know where God was leading them. And that he was called to not only reach out to the young, but to the old and everyone in between. 
That's why we have the lambs and the sheep. It encompasses the symbolism of the whole body of the church, the, all of the people. And then he said a third time, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Teach them about the ways of Jesus. Teach them the Bible. Teach them spiritual principles. Teach them how to forgive, how to pray, how to grow as disciples. That's what a revival is a part of. There's this whole process of us praying, learning to repent. We all have something to repent of, no matter how old or young you are. We try not to do that with the younger as much. But as we get older, we, we have to realize that we're not perfect. And we have to work at reconciliation. We have to pray about it. I talked about last week that I'm not perfect and I have those times where I have problems and conflicts with friends or family members. And that God keeps tugging on my heartstrings and going, forgive them. What did you do wrong? I just had reconciliation uh, on Friday. It's amazing when you're open to being reconciled and understanding what you did wrong and apologizing, or at least apologizing to God and being open to when you see that person to say, I'm sorry. And I heard this amazing analogy one time that someone said, it was a spiritual teacher, that true reconciliation is like a big hug. Now, how many of you are huggers? Some of you are huggers. Now, how do you hug? Do you hug with your full body in both hands? Yes, you do. See? Like this. Some of us are not huggers like that, naturally. Some of us are like, oh, okay. We're like, oh, boy. Yes. So true reconciliation. So if you think about it, if you're ready to reconcile with someone that you've had bad relations with or something bad has happened between you, they might be coming up to you like, give me a big hug. No, they're those huggers who do that. Oh, come here. And some of us are like, oh, no. <laughs> Thank God for COVID taught me. I could be like, no, no, no. <laughs> but there are some people that when they do that to me, I'm just like, I, I surrender because I do love them. You know, and I'm like, ah, eh, okay. I like a big hug every now and then. But so what happens is, is that's what reconciliation is like. One person wants to reconcile and the other person does not. Both people have to be willing or on the same page with it. So then it could be like, oh no, the one person's like, no, and oh. And the other was like, I love you. And then the other way could be that you're halfway there. So that's why you give the old, like, uh -huh. But if you really have prayed about it and repented and been open to it, you both will just come together like that. Because it'll be the right timing for you and them. Because sometimes we want to reconcile and the other people aren't ready. So in this story, that's what Jesus is showing us. You know, that's the big difference between Peter and Judas. Judas was so upset, so prideful, thought he was doing the right thing, was so disappointed that Jesus didn't do what he thought he should do. He messed up majorly. He betrayed him. But that didn't mean that God couldn't have forgiven him and that he should have just worked through it. He was so overwhelmed with grief and shame and pride that he, he didn't do it. But there's Peter. Peter is the example of the disciple who in that moment, here's Jesus, and you know he had to feel terrible, right? He denied him three times. So there he is, shows up. Hey, Peter. Oh, man. Right? Like, oh. And then he starts asking him in front of everybody. Not alone, not like one-on-one. -on -one. Like, hey, man, do you love me? No, like in front of everybody. Like, oh, man. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And that's a big thing. That's a picture of reconciliation according to the ways of Jesus. And this is all a part of reconciliation. This is all a part of revival. This is what the church needs to do. We have to pray. We have to be intentional about who God's leading us to reach out to, to be welcoming, to let go of our prejudices, realize we're not perfect. 
We need to apologize to people that we've hurt, even if our pride can't handle it. And then surrender. And this is what Jesus has taught us to do. This leads to revival within our own spirits and within our own community. And that causes growth and revival here. So I'm encouraging us all to continue throughout this season of resurrection, throughout the season of Easter, to pray about these things. How is God leading us to be reconciled to others, to forgive others, and to reach out to new people? So in conclusion, we are called to seek other people, to seek other Christians, to seek others who are being called to be Christians, and to gather them into the boat of the church, feed them, love them, and care for them. Amen. Amen. be seated. We are encouraged to affirm our faith in reciting the Apostles' Creed together. Therefore, join me in reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered unto Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, Holy God, the Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It is now time for the prayers of the people. Do I have any prayer requests from anyone out there that hasn't been written down, given to me? Yes, ma'am. Mr. and Mrs. Klingensmith. I miss the uh, Klinging Smith? Klingensmith. Klingensmith. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Someone over here? 
Yes. I think they mean you. Jay? Okay. How do you get COVID? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Ben, Rick, and Tom. Anyone up there? Anyone online? Got any requests, Rick? Richard? We will pray for anyone who's watching online that the Lord would bless them with healing, love, and grace as well. Yes? Okay, let us come before the Lord in prayer. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. We praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We seek to love you, Lord, with all of our heart, mind, and soul. We lift up to you, Lord, every single person that is in our hearts, in our minds, and in our lives, and ask you to bless them with healing, loving grace. We pray for all of those watching through streaming that they would be blessed with God's love, grace, and healing. We pray for healing and grace for Dan and Diane, for Lynn, for Bill, for Jerry, for the Tina Swarmer family, for Karen Poliard, for Nicholas, for Mary Ann, for Bob, for Bob, for Nancy, for Nicole, for Tanya, Kaylee, Sam, and Stone, for Bob, Suzanne, Jim, Adelie, Jack, and Dina, for Sarah, for the university students taking their finals, for Mr. and Mrs. Smith, for Jay, for Heidi, for all of those suffering and struggling with COVID and any various neuro, any viruses, sicknesses, illnesses, strep throat, cancer, emphysema, leukemia, various diseases that ravage the body, mind, and spirit, for those struggling with depression and mental health issues. We pray for blessings and healing for Marianne, for the Klein family, that you would give them comfort and peace during this time of grieving. We pray for Mary Lou and her family. We pray for Ben, Rick, and Tom, for Richard, and for Cindy. We ask you, Lord, to bless all of them with your healing, love, and grace. We pray for all those who are homebound, who are unable to be here with us in body and mind, but they are connected to us through your Holy Spirit. We ask you, Lord, to bless them and guide them and teach them. Help us, Lord, to discern your will for this church where you are leading us to reach out, how we are to be open to being reconciled to others, to forgive others, and to spread your love and grace to all those in need of understanding you. We ask all of this in the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's now time for our offering.
invitation that your kingdom of heaven would grow within this church, this community, and around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So once again, we're going to have the congregational meeting after I give the benediction. Anyone who 
needs to leave is free to go, but I encourage the rest of you to just stay in your pews and we will start shortly thereafter. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.